This is about the energy release you would get if you packed the entire volume of Jupiter with hydrogen bombs and detonated them all at once. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at another XKCD what if video. What would a magnitude 15 earthquake look like? Well, nuclear engineers do account for seismic effects in reactor and facility design, but I'm going to tell you right now, nothing is standing up to a magnitude 15, if it were possible. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. This is a question from Alex, who asks, What if a Richter magnitude 15 earthquake were to hit America at, let's say, New York City? What about a Richter 0? Or 25? <laughs> In New York City, um, good luck finding a fault line to even get you to 10. <laughs> 0 be tiny, 25 the Earth would not survive anything close to that. <laughs> if you could somehow get it that high, so I guess 25 earthquake wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense. Well, given that a magnitude 25 quake would destroy the sun if one happened there. It... <laughs> destroy the sun. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It would certainly destroy New York City. That's awesome. <laughs> but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The Richter scale, which has technically been replaced by the moment magnitude scale, measures the strength of an earthquake. Since we usually hear about earthquakes with ratings somewhere between 3 and 9, a lot of people probably think of 10 as the top of the scale and 0 as the bottom. In fact, there is no top or bottom to the scale. Nope, it's an, it's an exponential scale, no top, no bottom. And going negative does not mean you're going to have backwards earthquakes. <laughs> it just means they're going to be really small. But even if 10 isn't the top of the scale, it might as well be. A magnitude 9 earthquake already measurably alters the rotation of the Earth. The two magnitude 9 plus earthquakes this century both altered the length of the day by a tiny but measurable fraction of a second. Oh, and there we go. Uh, the March 2011 one. The, the earthquake and tsunami that made everyone aware of what Fukushima even is. <laughs> but yeah, that, that earthquake and tsunami was horrific. And what's crazy is... Over 18,000 people died from that earthquake and tsunami, and yet whenever it's brought up, it all seems to point to Fukushima, which had one direct death on site, not due to radiological release, and yeah, it did cause a massive evacuation, which likely the stress and panic for something like that is likely to take many years off of people's lives, but at least within my field, when remembering this it's all about the nuclear accident the tragedy seems to uh, of all the lives that were lost lost seems to be glossed over i mean even even the chernobyl accident didn't kill anywhere close to 18,000 people even if you go for the most conservative estimates and you're looking at the deaths that haven't happened yet due to long-term cancers. The most overly conservative estimates um, that, that continue into the future is 4,000 if you take that, if you use the most conservative modeling. The most widely accepted ones for Chernobyl are in the 50 to 60 range. But yeah, nine is is big and we mentioned 10 might as well be the top i don't know if there's an actual fault line on earth that could possibly give you a 10 because 10 is so much bigger than a nine in order to get to magnitude 10 you'd need a ruptured fault line three and a half thousand kilometers long <laughs> yeah and a magnitude 11 quake would require a fault that went halfway around the world a magnitude 15 earthquake would be a million times more powerful than that and involve the release of enough energy to evaporate all the water on earth so yeah, magnitude 15, that would make the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs look like a mosquito hitting your windshield. That asteroid impact, um, so just simply converting this magnitude into joules would give you between a 12 and a 13. So 15... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's surviving that one. Though if that happened, we could rest easy knowing the earthquake couldn't cause any tsunamis. Going a few steps further, True. a magnitude 18 earthquake would release nearly 10 to the 32 joules of energy, which is roughly the gravitational binding energy of the Earth. Yep, which is why I knew 25 was going to be way in excess, and apparently that's greater than the gravitational binding energy of the sun. And for those of you that are Star Wars fans, the Death Star's main weapon, which considering how quickly it blew apart Alderaan, and assuming Alderaan is similar enough to Earth, is on the order of 10 to the 38th joules, or, or about a 22. 
<laughs> it's fun using orders of magnitude like this. To give you a sense of scale, the strongest nuclear bomb, the Tsar bomb, uh, was a mere 8.3. And Hiroshima and Nagasaki are about a 6. Now I know this is earthquake, so this would be if you take that energy and channel it into a fault line, but it's interesting to play with these sort of numbers, I think. To put it another way, the Death Star caused a magnitude 18 earthquake on Alderaan. <laughs> he brought up the Death Star before I did. I guess technically it would because 18 would be the maximum in terms of if they measured it there, but if you measure it in terms of the Death Star's weapon output, I'm thinking it's closer to a 22, just considering it scattered the planet's mass far greater than escape velocity. But that one's a bit up for debate. You could in theory talk about a more powerful earthquake on Earth, but in practice all it would mean is that the expanding cloud of space debris would be faster and hotter. Kind of like the Death Star's main weapon. <laughs> The Sun, with its higher gravitational binding energy, could have up to a magnitude 24 quake. This is about the energy release you would get if you packed the entire volume of Jupiter with hydrogen bombs and detonated them all at once. <laughs> wow, good luck finding enough materials to make all those bombs, getting enough uranium, plutonium. <laughs> it might be cheaper to build the Death Star and use its magical power source. And good luck sinking them all at once to ensure one, one bomb going off just doesn't simply destroy some of the bombs. You would need a very precise sequencer because with that many and how quick nuclear reactions are, you would need to um, account for the however many milliseconds of signal delay and it would be great, and it would be, be more than an order of milliseconds if you want to be at a safe distance from this thing. Crazy. The most powerful quakes in the known universe, which occur in super heavy neutron stars, are about this magnitude. A magnitude 25 quake would occur. That makes sense. On the subject of neutron stars, one major advantage they have in terms of holding up compared to the sun is gravitational binding energy is inversely proportional to the radius. So you have a, say, a 10 solar mass object, but it's got a much smaller radius, so it's going to take a much more powerful magnitude star quake to destroy something like that than even destroying the sun. Explode the sun. Hold on, we're spending a lot of time thinking about things that are large and violent. What about the bottom end of the scale? Is there such a thing as a magnitude zero earthquake? So while we're on this subject, when designing a nuclear power plant to withstand earthquakes, you actually don't look at this scale. Instead, you look at the acceleration, which is typically given as some fraction of Earth's gravity. Because here you're talking about the Earth moving. So even, say, 0.1 g for a structure vibrating relative to Earth's gravity is a lot. And there's typically two parameters that get looked at. One is the operating basis earthquake, and that you mainly just look at your location and say, what is reasonable given the seismic history of, of the area? And say that's 0 0.05 G. And then there's your safe shutdown earthquake, which is typically much higher, say 0.1 G. And that is the earthquake that the plant, all of its safety systems, the acceleration that it can take, and and everything will work properly the reactor will safely shut itself down all the safety systems such as the emergency core cooling system will inject safely into the core say if there's a large reactor coolant leak and be able to keep the core cooled covered and properly reactive that's mainly what you look at when you design this criteria and the safe shutdown earthquake acceleration needs to be much higher than the operating basis earthquake, which makes sense. <laughs> you don't want to design something that isn't likely to uh, stand up to what is known to occur in the area. One interesting thing is some of the more modern designs, like the AP-1000 reactor, those facilities have safe shutdown earthquakes up to the 0.3G range, which is pretty good considering the size of the structure and how much heavy equipment it has. Now there's a lot of uh, strict criteria that goes when designing a seismic facility and even just maintaining it. Like e certain tool cabinets need to be anchored in, in the right spot and those are routinely inspected and snubbers in the piping and joints of the facility are routinely inspected 
every outage and there's there's a lot of them i used to work closely with the principal engineer that walked down every snubber during every outage every cycle to basically ensure that the plant can withstand earthquakes also hydraulic transients water hammer that sort of thing and should the safe shutdown earthquake be occur then the response the emergency response procedures are basically to make sure everything shuts down properly everything should respond automatically but there are additional options to manually shut down the reactor manually initiate safety injection either from the control room or locally if necessary we do train on having to locally open the reactor trip breakers but no, they are not in the reactor containment building like a lot of movies infamously portray. They are in the electrical auxiliary building, which is not even a radiological controlled area. Just have a plant operator, open the breaker, hot stick the breaker if necessary, and all the control rods fall in in a couple of seconds and the reactor is safely shut down. No radiological PPE required. Though if they're hot sticking a breaker, um, arc flash PPE is required, which is actually heavier than radiological PPE, usually. Yes, in fact, the scale goes all the way down past zero. Yep. Let's take a look at some low magnitude earthquakes with a description of what they would be like if they hit your house. A magnitude one quake releases the same energy as dropping a partially loaded cement truck from 10 meters onto the street in front of your house. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it would create a bit of a shock wave, but things below a three, you typically don't don't feel or you might not even notice that much and something as transient as that i mean and here we're talking the entire like basically the maximum amplitude so if this were to happen you might not even notice it very much it would just be a thud not a root not a not a rumble or a temblor or anything like that <laughs> <laughs> One other misconception about the Richter scale is a lot of people think each increase is a factor of 10, but that's not the case. It's, it's actually worse. <laughs> so you go by a magnitude of 2, so you go from 1 to 3, that's a factor of 1,000, not a factor of 100. So going up from 1 to 2 is an increase by about 30-something in terms of energy released from the earthquake. A magnitude zero earthquake is equivalent to the Dallas Cowboys American football team running at full tilt into the side of your neighbor's garage. A magnitude negative one quake is like a single American football player running into a tree in your yard. Silliness. So in nuclear engineering, we actually use a scale similar to that for doing a reactor startup. It measures it in startup rate, and the unit is decades per minute. One decade per minute is power level going up by a factor of 10 in a minute. And the meter does look something like this, though the units are a lot tighter. At, so at a commercial nuclear power plant, a good startup rate going into the point of adding heat, which is when you get a natural feedback mechanism from the higher temperature to slow the fission reaction down in a pressurized water reactor. And going into that, you're usually going at about 0 0.3, 0 0.2 decades per minute. It's or reactor power going up by a factor of 10 in three to five minutes. It's a very slow, methodical process. Now, a submarine reactor, um, during a startup, the limit is five decades per minute, or power going up by a factor of 10,000 in a minute. And a fast recovery startup, the limit is nine decades per minute, which is a factor of a billion in a minute. So going from microwatts to megawatts pretty quickly. The limit in the commercial nuclear power plant is one decade per minute. I've never seen anyone go anywhere near that fast. I don't even think you can. There's just not enough acceleration, for lack of a better word, in the reactor core. So, so nuclear submarines are like sports cars and commercial nuclear power plants are like freight trains in terms of acceleration. There is another way of determining how fast the reactor is start up and that's by using the reactor period that's not a rate that's a unit of time for reactor power to increase by a factor of e e being 2.71 and some change i've never used that in commercial nuclear I've seen that come up at research reactors. Clearly a bunch of nerds that think in terms of E rather than factors of 10. At least to me, that's that's less intuitive to me anyway. I don't know. Hey, if 
If you think better in terms of E, more power to you. <laughs> cat falling off a dresser would have a magnitude of negative two. What? The cat didn't land on its feet? Mm. A cat knocking your cell phone off your nightstand would have a magnitude negative three. <laughs> yeah, you deserve that. Magnitude negative four is like a penny falling off of a dog. Magnitude negative five. I love this scale. Usually you do the crazy extreme big examples first, but here we're doing the, the teeny tiny gentle ones. I like it. Five is a key press on an IBM Model M mechanical keyboard. Negative six is a key press on a lightweight keyboard. I don't know. I'm not sure I believe that one. Um, I've known some pretty aggressive typers. Um, are you sure they're not, they're not up to a zero or even a one? <laughs> I love it. Negative seven is a single feather fluttering to the ground. A fine grain of sand falling onto the pile at the bottom of a tiny hourglass would be a magnitude negative eight quake. And let's jump all the way down to magnitude negative, negative 15, 15, a drifting mode of dust coming to rest gently on a table. Wow, that's already down to, oh, dust is so, so light. Wow, that's awesome. Sometimes it's nice not to destroy the world for a change. The one thing I will say is one individual fission event of a uranium-235 nucleus, which is about 200 million electron volts, figures out to about minus 11.5, which is actually a lot considering that this is just one teeny tiny nuclear reaction as part of a nuclear power plant. After all, a nuclear power plant is about a 3.2 every second constantly for 18 to 24 months because remember these the energy yield from these earthquakes are typically momentary seconds to minutes but the thing nuclear power has is sustainability on its side i really like this video thanks so much for the recommendation i love playing with bizarre units of measure such as the richter scale and turning them into other things thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time